Okay, we're now live on the book club. So first of all, I would like to say hello and thank you for joining us live. Um, it is the 31st of March. This is the last episode in my series of Tracy Talks too. So I've had the honor of chatting to 54 amazing authors. And tonight um, I am delighted to be joined by Kia Abdullah, Mike Gale and Dorothy Coomson. So I'm going to ask you guys, as usual, if you don't mind, to just introduce yourselves a little bit and then we'll take it from there. So Kia. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Kia Abdullah, um, Londoner, born and bred. Uh, I'm the author of Take It Back and Truth Be Told. Uh, they're courtroom dramas set in East London, kind of a cross between Joe DiPico and John Grisham, uh, if that doesn't sound too grandiose. Yeah. Mike? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'm Mike Gale. Uh, I am the author of uh, 16, possibly 17 novels. I can't believe it, but I, I actually, I always remember when I first published my first book, I always thought, oh, I'll never forget that experience. And now I've actually forgotten how many books I've written, but it's probably 16 or 17. It's 18. Of which it's is, 18. It, it's 18. 18. Ah, well, thank you very much. Casey knows Google. more than me. I've lost the book somewhere in there. Um, <laughs> so my latest is All the Only People. Mm, there. Can you see? Can you see that? The light's bouncing off it. Yeah. Uh, there you go. All the Only People. Um, I've been writing since 1996, seven. I don't know. Uh, and. Um, yeah, my first novel was called My Ledger Girlfriend. And uh, yes, here I am 18 books later. Fabulous. Dorothy? Hi, um, I'm, I've written 17 books. I've just finished th that one there. I know what you've done. I've just finished that and that's on its way to being proofed. I, my latest book out is All My Lies Are True. And that's a sequel to my book, The Ice Cream Girls. And um, I've, like I say, I've written 17 books now and I do lots of things. I've got a podcast called The Happy Author. And um, yeah, I live in Brighton. Lovely. -ish. Have you had good weather down there today? Oh, we have. Past couple of days, it's been great. I've been, um, I've been putting out a box of books for people to take. Um, just the books that I've been trying to thin down my bookshelves because I've got too much books. And so when the nice weather's out, obviously I put them out and lots more people come and have a look at and walk away with the books. I, I'm sorry, so did you just say you've got too many books? Because I've never heard <laughs> no, that. No, I, ha I have got too many books, you know what? And I, I, I cry every time I pick, pick one up and go, I, I, need to give this, I need to give this to somebody else. Somebody else needs to love this book as much as I did. But um, there's just too much in my house now. There's just too much. So I can't get any more if I don't get rid of some. <laughs> um, uh, Lisa Jewell has just popped online and she sent big hugs. Hi, Lise. And Anne Cater has popped on and said, it's my friends in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> right, so what we will normally do is talk about our books, our books, your books, I just read them, you write them, I read them, um, and your road to publishing, and then we can just talk about other bits and pieces. But I just, there's a few things I, I obviously want, wanted to do as much research as possible. And there's just a few bits that I've just picked up that I, quite want to talk about first before we go in and Mike um you I know that you've talked about this a lot you were previously an agony uncle for just yeah. 17 and bliss I know you probably get asked this and no it, it's, it's it's absolutely fine yeah ask away well, what, what do you want to know the weirdest weirdest problem you ever had to deal with or one that you couldn't even publish well uh, great story so um basically uh, I was I was they used to send me all the letters up to Birmingham because I was freelance. And um, so I was going through my letters and I'd, I'd, I'd get all my sort of regular ones. And I looked, I remember opening the most one letter and said, uh, he said, uh, dear Mike, um, I've uh, got this, uh, I've had a problem with sore breasts and, um, you know, and I think it might be because of, you know, I've had a couple of children now and, and I was just like, hold on, that, that doesn't, seem like a bliss reader they're normally sort of 14 15 years old anyway threw it away a couple of weeks later 
get a similar one. Uh, dear Mike, uh, since I had my hysterectomy, and I was just like, what's going on? Why, why, why are middle-aged women writing to me, uh, asking for my advice? And it turns out that in the, um, in the building that we all worked in, um, there was a magazine. So I, we were on the fourth floor or third floor, and there was a magazine called Top Sante. And they had a Dr. Mike, and I was getting Dr. Mike's letters who were coming to Dear Mike. Um, so, uh, yes, that was the, the worst thing. I couldn't answer any of those, and I was horrified at the very idea of it. But did Dr. Mike get your letters then about I, how... I, 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 I suspect like he would have been equally baffled. <laughs> <laughs> right, and now, Kia, um, you've said you've written two books. You've actually got a couple of others I found on, on the... Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So these are the recent ones. Um, the others were published many, many years ago by very small presses. Um, and one thing I always say to kind of aspiring authors now is take your time. Don't rush. Um, because people who really love Take It Back and Truth Be Told, they go and root out these very old two novels. And I'm always a bit embarrassed by them just because I don't think I'd fi found my voice as a writer then. And so I always say to authors now, look, your debut novel is always going to be your debut novel. And so take your time, don't rush. Um, especially now with social media, I think you see all these people kind of getting success early and you feel like if you're not publishing in your 20s uh, or, or early 30s, you're somehow a failure. And I just, I just wish I had waited. And so I'm super proud of Take It Back and Truth Be Told. And the other two, um, yeah, I kind of sometimes actively put people off reading them because I just don't think I'd found my feet as a writer in those early books. So what did, so you've had your background, you, you, you're a travel writer? Yes, so I run a travel blog, that's kind of my day job. Um, I used to work for Rough Guides um, and then left in 2014 to do a big trip around the world set up a travel blog with my other half who's a photographer and that really took off and yeah so that's what I do kind of as a day job and then I write half the time as well write fiction half the time as well well I, I have read both your books and I was when I was doing my research Google. You, you've been amazing on Twitter by the way can I just thank you because you've been such a champion of take it back and I really appreciate I it both of them were phenomenal and I've just seen that there's a new one coming out which is really exciting we coming out yeah. in September so we'll talk yes. about that one a bit later but we'll talk about your main character your protagonist who is phenomenal as well thank um you. Mike before so so you obviously were an, an agony aunt and now I'm presuming you are a full-time author with your 18 books under do you still have a rabbit <laughs> <laughs> oh the rabbit sadly is long gone we, we've had uh, we had another rabbit after that so uh first rabbit um he went the way of all rabbits i suppose eventually um we had a second rabbit and after the second rabbit we decided that um we might go bigger so we we decided to get a greyhound and so we've got a, a rescued greyhound and um he was i think it was eight when we got him and he's He's probably 11, 12 now, That's and he's, uh, he's getting a bit old and doddery, but um, he's, he's... The, the really funny thing is actually, um, it was my wife, my wife lobbied really, really, really hard for a dog, and I was just like, not interested, not interested, not interested. And then a friend came with um, a lurcher to visit us with a lurcher, and I was a bit like, ooh. And, and this dog was like the best advert for dogs ever. He, he was like really chilled. Uh, and it, you know he and but big as well i'm not into small dogs and so after that i sort of said to, i said to my wife i said all right okay let's just have a look and she went did the research that was it and we we, we said we were only going to have a look and we went down to the rescue kennel where just they just do greyhounds and we we're lo looking around we we're looking for this small uh we we're looking at um a girl i think it was about six years old and as soon you know we saw, we saw it was all right and we saw had a little bit of a mooch round and as soon as i saw um our dog it was just like love at first sight <laughs> and it was just like bing and the really funny thing is is that um i'm his favorite it's more <laughs> dog but he adores me and will just he you know he's not right unless i'm in the room um so yeah that's the way. um Dorothy, living now, you've lived quite all over the place as well. You've, you've uh, travelled quite a bit and lived. 
But I, more importantly, I would note I found out that you wrote your first book at the age of thirteen. There's, there's a thin line between love and hate. Yeah. Are we ever going to see it published? You never know. Actually, do you know? I keep. Talk, I, I don't talk about it as much. Do you know? I thought you were going to unearth my other dodgy. Ooh writing things I was I was waiting for it you look so like mischievous I thought oh she's found out what I used to do um clearly you haven't um <laughs> I just love the fact that you, you haven't even hinted at what it was yeah. <laughs> um um yes I um yeah you might we might do you know I talk about it I think about it all, a lot actually it's it's obviously it's from way back when, back in the 1870s, when um, <laughs> when I was young. So it's, um, if I did try and write it now, it'd have to, I'd have to update it a lot for the teenage experience as it is now. So um, we might do, we might have a, a version of that story that might appear at some point. So we've got, I've just got my, I was gonna say, I did my research. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with a website called vipfaq.com. Me neither. No. Me neither. But oh. it came up and I put in Mike's name and I don't know if you can read this. Well, I'll read it out to you. It says, is Mike Gale still alive? Are there any death rumours? And I thought, what the hell have I come across? <laughs> yes, as far as we know, Mike is still alive. We don't have any current information about his health. However, being younger than 50, we hope that everything is okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was lovely. And then, and in the red, you can't really see, but it says, are there any photos of Mike Gale's hairstyle or shirtless? <laughs> um, there may, and the answer is there might be, but unfortunately we currently can't access them from our system. We are working hard to fill that gap though, check back tomorrow. And I thought, this is weird. And then I put Dorothy's name in and it came up the same. So Dorothy oh. is still alive and there's no shirtless photos of you. Oh. Well, are you sure? Are you absolutely well, sure about that? I, I'm now <laughs> under yours, unless you have another name. But interesting enough, Kia's on that as well. Don't no, look, she's looking shocked now. She's uh -oh. thinking <laughs> they found my shirtless photos. No, <laughs> they tell Sorry, you Mom. that you are precisely one thirteen thousand eight hundred eighty-four days old today. Well, that's thank what, you. And that you are, <laughs> you're a Taurus. I am indeed. There you go. And they are also saying that the typical positive traits would be would include practicality, mm -hmm. artistic Maybe. bent of mind, stability, trustworthiness, negative 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 character traits are laziness, stubbornness, prejudice, and possessiveness. I am <laughs> stubborn. I'm definitely stubborn. I'm not sure about the other ones. Okay. Right. But that was this. Now, we, I'm just going to read some of the things that have come on here. So, um, Saffron says, great idea, Dorothy, about getting rid of your books. She has a little local hutch of books. You could put your dead rabbit in that one. When it's, when it's <laughs> been fantastic over lockdown. Um, Anne Cater has done that this week, too. She's got rid of 54 books. But for Anne, that's just a day's read. So I don't <laughs> think a difference to her. Um, Joe Kelly remembers jo Top Santi and she wants to know why you didn't respond to her letter. Um, and she says, Take it back was excellent and it gave her real anxiety. Oh, I mean, we'll you. talk about it in a minute. Lisa Jules crying because it went the way of all rabbits. <laughs> um, and then Janet wants to know why I'm not sat in front of my new bookcase. But the reason, because last week I sat in front of my beautiful bespoke, this week it's because my, my, my son is home. <laughs> from university and I've been chucked out of the house. So now I'm, in the garden, I'm back in the garden. Um, right, so some of my favorite people in one virtual room says Bas Basim Khan, Louise Beach, hello everyone. And Louise has also said some impressive bookshelves, which we've, yes, very impressive. Um, now, um, I wanted to do a very quick pop quiz for Mike and Dorothy, because you've both written 17 through 18 books and Oh, right, okay. And I, I just wanted to know if you remember the characters in all of your books. Ooh. So if, if I gave you the name of a character, you will remember which book it's from. I'm going to go, we're all t we'll alternate. So Mike, Joe Clark. Uh, Joe Clark is from the, um, oh, it's from, uh, I can't even remember the titles of my books. <laughs> Joe Clark is from three other people. Very good. <laughs> um, Amber Salpone or Salpone? 
the chocolate run, um, Amber Salpone. Okay, thank you. James DeWitt, Mike. He's from... Um, uh... <laughs> My mind's gone blank. Um, the man I think I know. Oh, okay. Adele Brannan, Dorothy. My best friend's girl. She's good. She, you've been you've been checking. Yes, he's very, very good. Yeah. No, Matt, mine like a steel trap. Matt Beckford. Oh, turning thirty. Oh, oh, oh. Um, CC Solarin. He's the friend. Um, Dave Hardy. Oh, dinner for two. Very good. Clement C. Smithson. That girl from nowhere. She is good. She, you should go on Mastermind about yeah. <laughs> what the books, so, though. Do you know what? Yeah. One time, I did. My husband did a quiz with me on. Um, we did a quiz on my books, and he got more than I did. <laughs> uh, finally, um, my Will Kelly, my legendary girlfriend, and lastly, Kendra Tamal. Um, marshmallows for breakfast. Yeah, I didn't even know Kendra was a name until um, I watched the Kardashians. Oh, see, Kendra's one of the uh, Playboy bunnies as well. Oh. So when you did the search for Kendra, that would come up as well as Moshmares for breakfast. Do you know that from your secret writing job back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not answering that question here. Um, Janet Priest has asked a question to all of you, so we'll start with Kia. How many hours a day do you write? Do you do it every day? And do you have a word minimum, Kia? Uh, I do have a word minimum. So I try to write 50, 1,500 bad words a day. And then when I'm editing, it's it's fewer words per day. But I'll, I'll write for about six or seven months, five days a week, um, as long as it takes to hit that 1,500 words. Um, I mean, I say I do that. I've only written two books compared <laughs> to these guys. But you know that's the pattern I follow. Um, uh, and, and yeah, and then I just, uh, the editing is a far slower p process because I'm trying to, you know, put lipstick on a pig and, and make it attractive. And so that's my, that's my routine in a nutshell. Mike? Um, I, I, I suppose I, 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 I suppose I'm more time. I, I arrive at my office here uh, at eight o'clock uh, in the morning and I'll work till one and then I will walk the dog and I don't come back to the office again. So that that's that's when it's all going well, I think. Um, closer to sort of delivery time, I might do a second session in the afternoon, but I try and keep it mainly between eight and one. Dorothy? Oh, do you know, see all these people with their lovely organized <laughs> lives. I am just chaos. <laughs> I just do it whenever I can. And sometimes it's like, you know, sometimes I, I'm writing in bed and I fall asleep at one o'clock and I wake up at three and start typing again. Sometimes I go to my office. Um, I don't have a set amount of time. I just have, I just write until I get it done, until the, the book's done and I have to send it off. And then I look terrible and I look like I've been dragged <laughs> through a hedge several times backwards and forwards and sideways. And I, I look terrible, but you know, it's all part of the fun of it. I am trying to get better so I don't spend hours and hours spend writing all night, but um, it never really works out. Um, Anne Kate I just wants you to know that My Best Friend's Girl is one of the only books that she's ever reread. Wow, that's, 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 that's that a compliment. Is, that yeah. is a huge compliment, yes. Um, and Leslie Especially for Louise, a woman who has got a lot of books to read anyway. A so, lot uh, of books to read, yes. Her book post. I mean, we're trying to set up a GoFundMe page for her postman because we <laughs> think back in. The amount of books that woman gets, it's just not right. It's not right. Um, Leslie Lloyd wants, wanted to say that Truth Be Told is a real wow book. It's in her book of the year. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. That's so lovely. Um, right. Do you read much, guys? Do you? I mean, obviously you should. Um, do you read a, how many? I mean, they want to know how many how many books do you think you read in a year? Yeah. Well, I can tell you precisely because I use Goodreads.com and I do my year in books. Um, I think last year it was thirty six. So I'm not one of these people, you know, who read like one yeah. a, one a um, week. But yeah, maybe one a fortnight is is my average. Mike? I think I'll probably be probably about one a fortnight or one a month. Um, I really, it, it's funny, I, I go, it, it all depends on 
whether I'm how much I'm writing. Um, I've also really got into Audible over the last couple of years. So it just means that I'm the man with the with the headphones on walking the Greyhound. And, you know, the Greyhound wants to take a very short, they're, they're quite lazy, so he wants to take short walks. But if I'm really into a book, it means that we have to go out for a little bit longer so I can finish the chapter. So, uh, yeah, between Aud Audible and uh, normal ordinary books, it's probably one a month, one maybe once a fortnight, like one every fortnight, maybe. Dorothy? Oh, do you know, I have no idea because I get sent so many books to read, to give quotes to, so I end up sort of like putting everything else aside and reading those, and usually they're great. Um, and I kind of read them in two or three days, and then I won't read anything for a while because I'm writing. Or, and I've started listening to audiobooks. So I was always quite ambivalent about audiobooks because I thought that was it. That'd be like the gateway to not picking up a book again. But it actually turns out that they're actually really good because, you know, you can do other things. You could do your housework. So when I'm doing my cleaning, I can put a book on. Um, so I don't know. It could be five books a year. It could be a hundred. I don't, I have no idea. I just, people go to me, oh yeah, have you read this? I go, yes, I have read that. And then I've read this and I've read that. So, and it, because a lot of the time I read things before they're published because I'm giving quotes to people. So loads. I love reading. So I like to think I read a lot. And also I do a lot of reading for research. That's the other thing. So I read books for research. So that kind of counts as well. Right. I mean, we've got some more questions, but I'm going to just go through what I wanted to talk about. Okay, okay. I mean, let's face it, this isn't all about me. Um, so, Dorothy, a couple of things I've written down here. Um, you, your, your, my best friend's girl in 20, 20, I can't even say it, in 2006 was, um, was one of Richard and Judy's, which would, I would assume, have sort of sent you up into the stratosphere, must have helped incredibly. Um, and now you're, and you're apparently known, and this is Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, Britain's biggest selling black author of adult fiction. I almost said something completely wrong. <laughs> I forgot to say the selling. Britain's biggest black author. Britain's biggest selling yeah. black author of adult fiction. Um, wow, that's quite a statement, isn't it? It is. Yes, it's amazing. You must um, be so yourself. And you know what? My best friend's girl. It was. I mean, it's a long time ago, but I was in Australia when it came out. I was living in Australia when it came out over here. And um, I had no idea that it was doing so well. And then, I mean, it, it sold really well before Richard and Judy. And then obviously that took it to a new level, but it was just amazing, the whole. And I still haven't seen anybody reading one of my books, which is hilarious, because sold how many of a million and I've never seen anyone reading my book. Although my husband did see somebody on the seafront yesterday when he was went out for a run. He saw someone um getting all her stuff out of a out of a beach hut and she had Goodnight Beautiful in her hand to start reading. But I've never seen anyone reading one of my books. Okay, so I had a I had a heart attack on the central line once because I looked over and somebody was reading the hardback of Take It Back, which is a black and white cover and I was like <sighs> and then I realised it was Tana French's The Witch Elm. <laughs> I'm going to ask our viewers if they can grab a copy of any of Dorothy's books and take a photo of you <laughs> reading it and then please tag yourself and tag Dorothy on Twitter and let's get that going. Let's get Do your it. out there. That'd be great. Um, yes, so did you meet Richard and Judy? No, I was in Australia, so I didn't get to. And this was um, before they started... The book um, before they started the physical people meeting them or doing the podcast and the TV show. So it was actually, they actually had, they gave it to a book group, an actual physical book group to read. And Donna Eyre, she, she, um, she did the presentation about it. And then they had three people in the um, studio talking about it as well. So no, I didn't get to read them. I did meet them at another point, but not then. Kia, you're the founder of the Asian Book List. Can you tell me it's a non-profit that advocates for diversity in publishing, which is obviously a big issue at the moment and has come to light over the last yeah, year? Yeah, sure. So to, to be honest, I just, I was invited onto a radio programme to talk about diversity in publishing. Um, 
and there were four authors and it was the same old questions you know it was well Lionel Shriver says this and what do you think about that and are we lowering quality in order to you know increase diversity in publishing and I just got so fed up with it and I thought well I can do something proactive rather than answer the same old questions again and again I can actually do something proactive so I set up Asian Booklist Dot com, which sends out a quarterly newsletter to subscribers of new books by British Asian authors. Uh, they're all listed on the website as well. Uh, and then also just keeps track of how many Asian authors are hitting the bestseller list. Because so often what happens is you might get authors of colour being published, but they're very seldom chosen as the kind of flagship books or the you know major titles and so they don't get necessarily get the marketing budget and so i wanted to have a kind of data backed way of saying well asian authors are underrepresented on the bestseller list by 55% and is that because you think we're not as talented or is that because we're not getting the investment uh, because i believe literary merit is equally distributed you know no matter what race or class you are and so what's happening here and so it was a way for me to say look these are the numbers they can't be denied pull your socks up basically well dorothy you were very outspo outspoken but you spoke out spoke up spoke out um obviously criticizing the uk publishing industry as being a hostile environment for black authors and that has had an incredible following and, um, and support has, has anything changed or has, are you any any more information on that um i'm hoping things change you know things always when you've been around for a while you see things come around and you know people are they get behind something for a bit and then they kind of don't and you know they kind of find ways to not support something or it kind of they find a way to live with it so i i'm hopeful i'm always hopeful that things will change and um yeah I'm hoping. I'm still hoping. I, I know that certain people are working on stuff and they are working on it because they're not talking about it. And this is the thing when people. Kia, just she'll be back. I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Bye, Kia. Um, <laughs> people kind of um, they talk about it in publishing, particularly. People talk about stuff and they talk about it and they talk about it and talk about it and nothing ever gets done or one little thing get done and they'll praise themselves because they've done this amazing thing and nothing kind of moves on. So I'm really hoping that, you know, that things change and things get better. I have seen some things getting better, but, you know, and I'm part of the management committee of the Society of Authors. So, and I'm, we're talking about changes that need to happen there as well. So. I'm hoping things change, really do, and it becomes a inclusive environment for everybody, and that's what working towards. I don't, um, I'm not sort of like banging the drum because I want anything special for, particularly for me. I, I'm not. It's not about me. It's about everybody. I want everybody to have an equality of opportunity. I don't believe in just doing stuff for yourself. I'm always about trying to help other people. So as I said in my letter, I've been very fortunate. I've done very well. I have, I've had not as much awful things happen to me and being said to me as other authors. So, you know, but I didn't write my letter for me, necessarily for me. I wanted to write it for everybody else and other people coming up and other people who are there who are, have, are struggling. So I'm hoping things change. I don't know if they will. I'm going to, like I say, be hopeful and keep hoping that things do get better. Hmm. Mike, have you got anything? I mean, obviously, you're also not, not only are you, um, you're a very successful writer, but you write in a genre that's not, not necessarily, no, men are not necessarily known. I know yeah. you don't like the word chick lit. I've, I've read that. And I, but I love lad lit, lad lit. That's really cool. But so you are an author of lad lit. I would have just said contemporary. Yeah. But do you find as well being 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 an author of color and writing a genre that's slight. You're you're probably in the minority of that genre as well as an author. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a, it's a strange thing because you know I, I because I've worked in teen magazines. Uh, 
I was, I was, you know, I wasn't even really conscious of the fact that um, everybody, pretty much everybody in the office was a woman, and uh, I was writing for an audience of women, I, and I was this black male doing this. It didn't even occur to me. I just sort of got on with it because this is what I wanted to do, and I felt a similar sort of way when it came to publishing. This was just something that I wanted to do, and um, and it's it's interesting about about publishing and race because. Um, generally, when I when I turned up, when I was first was first published over twenty years ago, um, publishing was very 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 white. Not only was it very white, but it was also very white and very middle class. And we cut to twenty years later, it's slightly less white, just just a teeny bit less white. Um, and just a teensy winty bit more diverse in terms of social class, but it's it's there's been no ma no major moves I don't think across the, the the last twenty years. I mean, I I was at an event and I met a couple of um, editorial assistants and agents, um, not agents, editorial assistants and uh, editors, and it was the first time that I'd met people of color in an editorial environment so that that and that's across 20 years so it's a it's a very slow move um in terms of i mean the interesting thing about in terms of marketing in terms of being marketed as a black author interestingly i've never had that problem i've never had that label attached to me despite the fact that my pit my pictures are on the every single book um and it was interesting because I had a slightly different experience when I went to America, where it was definitely m very much you are a black author, um, and having not having just been treated as an author here in the UK, it was very strange to sort of have all that reversed. But apart from that, you know, I suppose this, things haven't changed. Things aren't aren't great. There isn't it isn't that diverse. Things haven't changed, but people are talking about it now. But what use is talk? No, I, mean, I, I, like Dorothy said no I, I agree, but I'm just saying it's now becoming a lot more people. I mean, Vaseem Khan has just met us and said, um, will you touch on the race report that came out today? Um, I don't know if, I'm not, I'm not sure what he's talking about. Would you be interested in hearing the views? Is of this the one that says that there's, there's no systemic racism within the UK? Yes. Yeah. Okay. He said, is there an institutional problem in publishing or not? I think we touched on that. Have I lost you? No, no, no. no. I'm still here. I have nothing to say. <laughs> I'm just sitting here quietly <laughs> waiting for someone else to talk. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm nothing to say me at this time. Not, 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 um, yeah, nothing to say really. Right. Um, Kia, a very specific question. If we sign up to your Asian book list quarterly tonight, will we get tomorrow's? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I haven't scheduled it yet. So. Sign up now. so she's signing up now. And Mike, what yep. is that creepy little hand? <laughs> <laughs> I get this question a lot. Oh. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can turn it. Okay. Creepy little hand. It's me. Uh, it's it's uh, a little. It's a drawing that my uh, youngest daughter did of me when she was uh, six, and uh, for some reason I've got silver hands. Uh, so there you go. But I've got a smart tie on and a jacket and silver shoes, which you can't see. There you go. There you go. Right. So um, and also we just also have to say congratulations to Mike because you are you be you're set to receive the outstanding achievement honor at the 2021 Romantic Fiction. Awards. Oh, you've got oh, it. Received it. <laughs> That's beautiful. I'd like to thank. Could you? Could you just do? A, did you do an acceptance? Was Was it? Zoom? Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. And it was. It was. Uh, it was really good fun, actually. Considering it, is, it was a virtual event, um, it, it couldn't have been up any better. We, uh, we had a really good time. Opened a bottle of champagne. Didn't have to get dressed. Good. Uh, I, I did get dressed. Oh. Um, uh, I, I did consider going topless, if only for that website. But um, <laughs> no, no, it, it was no. It was a really good time, and the the R and A are a lovely bunch, actually. Yeah, they've been very supportive. 
Um, Dorothy, um, hold on, I'm just having a, has, have any of you ever self-published? Did you, or did you, were you lucky enough to go straight in to be published? Self-publishing okay. wasn't a thing when, when I started, so, um, it was just I a mean, thrill and the well, I mean, people did self-publish, but I mean, it, 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 it was very great. different back in that, back yeah. then, because yeah. when I was trying to get published, first of all, self-publishing, it wasn't called self-publishing and it wasn't what it is today. And this is what I try and explain on my um, podcast as well. Back then it was called vanity publishing and you were paying someone to publish your books and to produce a couple of hundred copies for a lot of money. And they would, they would tell you they're publishing your book and they would do nothing for it. Now self-publishing, you're setting up your own publishing company. You're setting up your own business. You're getting a proper cover. You're getting an editing, getting it edited and you're selling it and you're finding your readers. So it's such a different thing. And back then when I was trying to get published and what from what Mike's saying, when he was trying to get published, it wasn't about, self-publishing wasn't a thing in the way it is now. Now it's such a different endeavor. So no. Also, um, Gemma was, wants you to know that Good Night Beautiful is still one of her absolute favourite books. She read it years ago, but she still recommends it to, the, to people all the time. Oh, bless her. What was the, your inspiration before, uh, for that book? Well, when I was in Australia, I, um, just before I left, I met five different people who had, at different points, been involved in surrogacy or egg donation. And I just found it really fascinating, this whole thing where somebody had agreed to have a baby for somebody who was their friend. And then it kind of, in every single case, the relationship was irreparably damaged. They couldn't get back to who they were because of it. And, um, and one woman, she had donated her eggs and her, the child that was born looked exactly like her. And her mother had a real issue with the fact that she donated these eggs and this child had been produced from it for her. She donated the eggs to her friend. And, um, and so the grandmother was really, really upset that there's a child growing up look, who looked like her, but was nothing to do with, her, you know, with the, yeah. with the grandmother. So I just thought, wow, what, what a, what a thing subject to write a book about, you know, surrogacy and how it affects people. And at the same time, the whole mental health issue um, and mental illness and how the, so those sort of things combine to create this story. So, yeah, that was the, kind of the inspiration. Thank you. Let me just have a look. Oh, Juliet Butler loves Mike's bookcase. Gemma, love, love, love your work, Dorothy. <laughs> Louise Beach, what has been the absolute highlight, best moment of your career so far, obviously apart from tonight? <laughs> Mike and obviously no. winning, winning the 2020 <laughs> the Romantic Fiction Award. Well, it, like? well, it was funny actually because uh, uh, you guys were talking about seeing someone read your book, and I always remember when my literary book Girlfriend first came out. Um, I was on a train coming from Birmingham, going through from London to Birmingham, and we were just pulling out of Euston, and everyone's getting out their papers or doing whatever. And I looked across the aisle and the woman at the table opposite was reading My Literary Girlfriend. And she was like reading the, like, the last 30, 40 pages. And I couldn't take my eyes off her. I, I was just like, there's somebody reading my book right there, watching her. And so she, she laughed a few times. I thought, oh, that's good. Uh, and then she pulled her face a few times. I thought, well, not so good. And then, and this is no word of a lie, she got to the end and she started to cry. I said, I it's not right. I've got to say something to her. But can you imagine how weird it would be that you're in this moment? <laughs> you know, you're reading an Agatha Christie. Hello, I'm Agatha Christie. <laughs> it was such a weird Amazing. thing. I was taught. And of course, you know, it's a really packed train. So there's no way of doing this subtly. So I, I, I sort of stood up and I said, excuse me, you're gonna sound, it's going to sound really weird, but you know, I'm Mike Gale. And she looked at the back of the book and she looked at me and she went, you're Mike Gale? I went, yes. And we had this amazing conversation about the book, about her life, about the things that she connected to with the story. And I just thought, this is amazing. You know, I used to have to have 
that actually talk to women to make them cry. And now I'm doing it <laughs> by just by reading my words. It's amazing. So, uh, yeah, that was my all-time favourite moment. And I bet she still talks about it too. Well, bizarrely, I hadn't... Um, I thanked her in my uh, in my second book, Mr Commitment, and I hadn't seen hiding a hair of her. I mean, it was different days, and I was searching my name on Twitter, and she was, somebody had asked this question, what's the strangest encounter you've ever had, or best encounter you've ever had with an author? And she said, I met Mike Gale on the train. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we had a little bit of a chat on Twitter. Um, I, you know, it's like maybe 20 years ago. Um, but yeah, so it's lovely. So that's, that's me. That's a cool one, though. Dorothy, top that. <laughs> oh, do you know, so many. I've, I've been so fortunate. I've had so many highlights, so many great highs. I think, well, one, several of them are when people come to events and black women come up to me and say, do you know what? I picked up your book and it's the first time I've been the character. Someone looks like me is the main character of a book. And... Um, and I feel like a, I feel like a real person now because I'm the hero of a book, and I'm not the sassy best friend or the, the the sexually aggressive, you know, antagonist. I am this, I'm the main character who's kind of kooky, and people think she's beautiful, and people people love her, um, and you know, it's got awards. Um, but one of the things that always sticks with me was this woman who was well, this teenager who emailed me years ago and said that she'd come to England and um, she would, she'd been, something really awful had happened to her and she'd come to England and she decided when she was gonna go home, she was gonna kill herself. She was just gonna, because of this thing that had happened to her. And she got into water, um, Waterstones on uh, Oxford Street and picked up one of my books, Marshmallows for Breakfast. And she said, she went home, she went back to her hostel and she read this, read this book. She doesn't know why she picked it up, but she read it. And she realizes she didn't want to do to do that when she got home. So she got home and she spoke to somebody and um, a teacher who then helped her to tell her parents what had happened to her. And so she got the help she needed. And I was just like, flood to tears, this woman, you know, because my book had stopped her from doing this awful thing. So I think that's probably pretty much a career highlight that some, I'd helped somebody without actually realizing um so she emailed me about a year afterwards to tell me that i'd basically saved her life so so that's probably pretty high up there well i think kia i feel sorry now <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how you're gonna go kia? um I, I suppose for me um apart from holding my first hardback you know which was always going to be a big moment i think just getting the offer through um because i had uh, my kind of biggest barrier to publishing was finding an agent and then after the the agent the deal came quite through quite quickly but i was in the outback in australia um camping uh, as you do and uh when we woke up we we we, we were driving and i got an, the email from my agent and it said news and then said and said i'm really pleased to be emailing you with this and then of course the rest of the email didn't load because we were out in the outback oh. and for about yeah i know for about an hour i was just kind of stewing in this van going oh my god what is it what is it what is it and then it was a two book deal from harper collins and you know i just had to being english you know had to be very restrained because there were about 15 people on the bus but i was just you know i was just brimming with pride and happiness and you know it it was amazing and yeah, since then, you know, I've gotten another two book deal with them. And so I think that was probably the biggest moment. Now, a big moment in an author's career, and I'm sure it's not the, the, the pinnacle, but it's is when one of your books gets made into TV or, or and I'm sure everyone gets their books optioned all the time and some things sometimes. In the, and Dorothy, I've told you this at Harrogate when I met you about watching the ice cream girls with my husband. And I was really smug because I'm just smug anyway. <laughs> Watching the ice cream, having read the book, loved the book, thought it was phenomenal. So excited. I said to my husband, who doesn't read, you've got to watch this. It's fantastic. And I knew obviously what was coming. And I can't remember how many parts it was. I think maybe three. 
three parts so you know the first part i'm smug because i know what's happening the second part i'm like yeah 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 and because it's third part and he's like i think i've worked it out i'm like go on then and he tells me i went no because i knew and i went you're never gonna guess they changed the bloody ending didn't they yeah it changed quite a lot right. about it really i was wrong and i look like an absolute schmuck thank you <laughs> can't believe they changed the ending nothing to do with me nothing to do with no, i know with me, i know you know but, they changed, yeah. They changed. What's it? They changed the ending. They changed the setting. They changed the the, the, the killer. They changed the killer. They changed the <laughs> characters. It was, it was. It was just had the same title. It was just a very. It was a different rendition of my story. That's what I'm going to say. Different rendition of my story. Mike, have ha, any of yours? Would Would you like to see any of yours? Sort of Netflix to death, or um. So uh, I mean, the, the, the one that that's closest at the moment is um half a world away which came out uh, two years ago and um it's a, it's a strange story I, I, I was at a world book event um at um h club in london and so they, they had lots of authors and actors um doing readings from books and i was in the green room and um michelle collins of eastenders fame um, sort of came up to me and we, we sort of had a chat and she said oh what do you do and I told her and she said oh you know and I, I get and she said oh have you got anything have you got a book and I, I gave her I only had like a, a 30 page sampler that I'd been given by the publishers anyway uh, we exchanged emails I didn't think any more of it I just thought it's you know sort of lovely thing that that happened and then anyway uh, about a couple of weeks later she said uh, have you got the book and I, and I talked to my publishers, got her a book. And she said, I love this book. Uh, I read it straight away. Um, can I get the rights for it? And I was just like, all right. So I, I, I gave it, mentioned it to my agent. My agent dealt with it. She, Michelle Collins, I, she's an absolute dynamo. She single-handedly basically put together a deal. Um, it was just, she said, she said to my agent, she said, oh, just give me three months and I'll get you a deal. And she went away three months. She met with producers and she came back with a, with this really great deal. So it's been optioned by um, uh, the guy who does, you know, Afterlife, the Ricky Gervais thing on yes, uh, Netflix. Yes. Uh, the executive producer from that and uh, another executive producer who's, who's, who's recently made a film. And yeah, and we've got a writer on board. So we're just waiting to see what will happen. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And it's all from her determination. Right. Well, I, I spoke to you before we came online about that book, how I was listening to it. Yeah. Um, and I was listening to it going around Tesco's and I got to a certain point in the book and started sobbing and people were worried whether it was because they'd run out of pasta and toilet roll. <laughs> that's, that's the extravagance of my life. Meanwhile, Anne Cater, would like you to know that she was sobbing by the pool in Corfu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Tesco's by the toilet roll. She's in Corfu by the pool. Says it all, really. Um, but no, that's very exciting. I can see that being made into a, a great. So yeah. if they get the casting right, then I. Can yes, yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Kia, let's talk about your two books. They're as they are standalone but they are a series and they should really be read in order, I think, as most books should be. Can you tell us a little bit about the protagonist and the idea from it and what they're about? They're yes. very, very powerful books. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so Take It Back is the is the first one. Um, we meet a 16-year-old girl called Jodie uh, in it and she, is, she accuses four classmates of rape. Uh, Jody is white and the four boys she accuses happen to be from Muslim families and so that immediately draws the attention of the press and the public and it becomes a, a, a bit of an explosive criminal trial and it was way, my way of kind of grappling with the almost kind of de facto ill treatment of Muslims we see in the media um, and the kind of message, you know, I, I don't like to use the word message because it can just be read as a page turner. But the message of the book is not to judge people based on what they look like or what they believe in. Um, because I, I believe people do things because they choose to do them as individuals, not because of the colour of their skin or they happen to be Muslim. Um, and then in the novel, Zara Khalil, who's an ex-barrister, she takes on Jodie's case. And she has to deal with accusations of being a traitor, because she, as a Muslim woman, is pitching herself against four Muslim boys. 
And that's something I've seen in my life. People just assume that because I'm from a Muslim family that I'm def by default going to side with uh, Muslim people in the media and so on. But that's the, the kind of two sides of the same coin. You're um, treating us as a homogenous entity in the same way that certain tabloids, I was going to name and, and name and shame, but certain tabloids do. Um, and then she comes back in Truth Be Told. She's This time she's helping a different protagonist um, in a different context, but it's the same sort of uh, setup. And then the third novel is a standalone, and that's the one out in September. Oh, so it hasn't got, oh. No, because I didn't write Take It Back as a series. It was meant to just be a standalone. But because Take It Back got so much attention, my publishers, you know, publishers being commercial, let's face it, you know, that they are a business at the end of the day, said we want more of Zara. And so I wrote Truth Be Told, and that was really, that was received really well. But I find most joy in kind of creating characters uh, and build, building them up from scratch. And so, you know, there, there is a temptation because people know and love Zara and it's almost like, you know, coming back to a friend uh, and she's already fully formed. And so a lot of the work is done. But yeah, I'm not sure if I'll go back to her. People ask me to, but I'm not sure yet. Can we just cut? I'm going to mute you now. I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> You, what you didn't mention in the first book, where the, I mean, it's not really part of the storyline, but it was quite interesting, is that the young girl Jodie, who is white and has is a, his accusing these four boys of raping her, is also um, facially disfigured. Yeah, so that kind of feeds into the theme of the novel as well, because what happens is people say people assume that, I mean, without getting too dark, that rape is always sexually motivated and it's not it's often motivated by violence or power and so again it feeds into this thing that you might look at Jodie and say well why would these four boys force themselves on her um but it's feeding into the same thing that appearances aren't always what they seem and so I thought that was a nice way of kind of dovetailing with the theme of the novel mm. well if you if anyone hasn't read that book out there I can 100% recommend very yeah, very powerful some shocking bits in it some big oh my god gasp out loud moments um and it's a book that will stay in your mind and get under your skin because it's so powerful so i would Thank highly you. recommend that book um and i'm very much looking forward to reading your new one mike on now book number i presume it's now i'm saying it's book number 18 it could be book number 19 or it could even still be 17 the <laughs> museum of ordinary people which is meant to be out next year how are you doing with it uh yes it's it's all it's, it's all happening it's all yes it's nearly done um it should have been done earlier but um it wasn't so uh yeah can, we're you, getting there. We're can getting. you tell us anything about it um i could <laughs> I, I i've got a policy of um it's really difficult when when something's not finished and you tell somebody about an idea <laughs> Um, if they don't go, yes, this is the best thing I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> nothing else is going to do, really. So it's probably best if I just don't say anything, and then we, no one's going to be disappointed. Well, we'll meet again then in twenty twenty in twenty twenty two, and we'll chat about it then. Please do, yeah. Um, Dorothy, let's talk about your latest book. Then I know what you've done. Tell yes. me, tell me about it, please. Um, well, it's the. It's set in a sort of post-lockdown world, um, and it's about a woman called Ray, who has a knock on a frantic knocking on her door one more one afternoon, and opens the door, and it's her neighbour who she kind of knows, um, and her neighbour basically has been attacked, and she hands Ray this diary and says to her, "Find out it's in there who has attacked me, who's tried to kill me," and sort of like disappears and Ray is left with this diary. Um, the woman is sort of sent, taken to hospital in a coma and she, the police tell Ray that she's going to die. Um, she opens this diary, this book, and discovers that Priscilla, the woman who was knocking on her door, has been keeping tabs on the neighbors for the past year or so, um, writing down all the things that they get up to and has found out all these dodgy secrets. And so Ray is sort of thinking, well, I'll just hand it over to the police. And then she sees her husband's name in there. 
and then realizes that her husband could be one of the people who tried to kill Priscilla and that her husband has been up to some dodgy things. So when the police ask her if she knows anything else, um, she's like in this situation of going, yes, here, have this diary that's going to help you find who tried to kill Priscilla or keeping it and trying to find out what her neighbors have got up to, including her husband. Ooh, and that's out now. That's out in July. All My Lies Are True is the sequel to The Ice Cream Girls, which is out right. now in paperback, yeah. So you, you would need to have read The Ice Cream Girls, do you think, to have read that? No, I wrote, it as a, I wrote All My Lies Are True as a standalone book. Um, so you kind of get caught up during the, um, the story of what happens in The Ice Cream Girls. You find out what happens in The Ice Cream Girls. But I had to be very careful because I didn't want to spoil the ending of The Ice Cream Girls for anybody else. Yeah. So it was really hard. So I wanted to, so if you read All My Lies Are True, you can then go back and read The Ice Cream Girls without knowing what happened at the end. But I had to make sure you knew enough to read this book. So it is a kind of a standalone as well as a sequel. You mentioned pre-lockdown. Would any of you now consider writing a book about, <laughs> not necessarily about COVID, because that's a pretty boring, but bringing COVID, or should we just like skip 2020 and move on? <laughs> Mike, I mean. I was talking about it with, with a couple of author mates and we, you know, and, and some people were actually in the middle of, um, I had one friend who always sets her books in the year that she's living in. And uh, she backpedaled and put it to a couple of years early. And I, and I, I think there's a, you know, it's, it's interesting because I've spoken to a couple of, uh, lots of readers about it and a lot of them were just saying, we don't want to read COVID books. We don't mm. want to even really think about it. And so I suspect that, I, I know certainly from my point of view, um, we'll just be glossing over it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my point of view anyway. Dorothy? Well, this is the, the All My Lives Are True. That was set in 2020. So I had to write a disclaimer at the front of the book, basically, saying, yeah, you know all the stuff they do in this book? That's <laughs> not, yeah. It's fictional. Well, it it's was fictional. fictional. Right? Just yeah. remember, remember what it was like. Remember what it used to be like. And, um, and you know, I write about books that are set in the real world, so I can't pretend it didn't happen. Like, it's not about... Well, I know what you've done is not about COVID and lockdown and stuff, but it has, you know, we live in that world now. We live in the world where people, you know, you are anxious and you don't see as many people and stuff. So it comes, it's kind of in there because I, don't, I can't gloss over it, but it's not about COVID and it's not about lockdown. It's not about, you know, if it mentions it, it's like, oh, we're here now and this is what where we're living and how we're living. So it's not, um, but you know, I don't know. I don't know. Do we pretend it didn't happen? How can we? So many people lost their lives, lost their livelihoods, lost their, and yes, we read fiction to escape our world, but also we read fiction to make sense of it. So, you know, if people want to write books about lockdown, then I'm sure I'll pick it up. I'm sure other people will pick it up. A lot of people won't. A lot of people want to pretend it didn't happen and that's fair enough well for me i kind of had to mention it yeah but you know um it's not harking on about it and it's not about covid or lockdown or whatever but it is a kind of that sort of world kia would you or have you is your latest book mention it or um well fun, funnily enough i mean next of kin is set in 2020 i think and at some point i realized that either I was going to have to choose not to mention it at all, or as Mike said, you know, set it in another year. And then eventually I just took out the year. I had to email a barrister who consults on my novels. And I said, when you stand up in court and you say, you know, so-and-so did this on the 21st of August, do you always say 2020? And he said, actually we don't. So, so that just made it easy for me. I just excised 2020 from my novel. As Mike said, I just think people are, are tired of it now. And when you read a book, it's escapism. And so there will be brilliant novelists out there who process this as part of, you know, the the canon. But for me, I, you know, my books are, they, they do engage with contemporary issues, but 
I don't think I don't feel that I need to engage with COVID, so I I won't be. No, I mean, it's strange because I read a book last year, um, and one of the first things they do is the character puts on a mask to go into the sweet shop, and it was like, oh, too soon. It's just too <laughs> soon. <laughs> And I was really uncomfortable and it kind of ruined the book for me because I didn't want to think about that. But yet, right. if I'm watching The Chase and they're standing too close together, I'm like, they're standing too close together. <laughs> but then I'm thinking, you know, all the lonely people, mm. Hubert would be screwed if he was in the middle of lockdown. <laughs> Maybe he could go out and do what he needs to do. I mean, that was, that was one of the really interesting things about All the Lonely People is that it, when I, I wrote it, when did I write it? I, I wrote it the year before. When did I finish it? I must have finished it the year before last. And yet when I remember having a conversation with my my editor and my agent and, you know, when lockdown happened, they all, and my book was coming out in, in hardback. So, and um, I, I remember it was all saying, we couldn't quite believe just how personal it was given everything that was sort of unfolding. And, and so, you know, in one book, you've got a book about, isolation and loneliness which is something that probably wouldn't have been on people's minds last year last year or sorry the year before last but last year and this year has been at the forefront of people's mind and at the same time you know you've got this pensioner who um who wants to make a difference and what was interesting is i, I saw a real a good read say I, I really enjoy this book, but you know, I thought the thing about the uh, pensioner who who sort of um, changes has this movement and changes the changes things was a, a little bit too uh, outlandish. And you kind of go, well, hang on a second, did you not read about the pensioner who's just raised thirty four million for the NHS? <laughs> so it's quite it's quite interesting, and uh, and of course the, there's a the whole um, Black Lives Matters thing as well that was going on last year. So suddenly, race loneliness people trying to make a difference was all uh, was all in there. It was all sort of in the ether. And somehow the book managed to capture that as well. Yeah, and again, I just finished writing up my review. You broke me, thanks very much. I mean, enough, <laughs> with, you, enough with, you know. Um, Leslie Lloyd would like Mike to know that you have the best Brummy accent. Oh, thank you very <laughs> much. You can't write, you've got a really good Brummy accent. <laughs> Um, so we talked. We've talked about quite a bit, I think, tonight. We've talked about now, as just a reader, and not anyone with, with any. I've got you know no desire to do anything other than read good books, good books, and spread the words. Let's talk about some authors that you recommend that are, perhaps we can advise people. Anyone out there that we should be keeping an eye out? Any books or authors that need a nod? Dorothy. Well, this is book that. Who's Loving You? Okay. And it's love stories by women of colour. And um, I've got a story in there, but that, don't let that sway you. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually a really good book and it's full. It's got some really nice love stories and they're just love stories. They're not, well, I was going to say they're not soppy, even if they were, so what? It's the sort of thing that we need right now, you know, just sort of people to be, it's just nice. It's just a nice book, you know. If you if you fancy something that's different from all the murder and death and you know, just sort of stuff that sort of like touches you, touches your heart. That's the sort of thing I'd. That's the sort of thing that I think I need at the moment. So yeah, I'm going to recommend that one. Um, sorry, Mike. Before we just Susie says Mike has clearly seen the future as ATLP was oh all the lonely people. I hate yeah. these acronyms. It takes <laughs> they are. Sorry, as all as all the lonely people was spot on. Read the BLM pandemic. So he just she just wants to know what are next week's lottery numbers. <laughs> Number six, number eighteen. <laughs> uh, no, no. Right, Mike, any any authors that you want to give us? Um, well, I, I tell you what. Here, uh, here are some proofs. I, I I can't specifically, but here are some proofs that I've received recently. So um, there's the rehearsals by Annette Christie that I'm quite. Can you see that? That yep. I'm looking forward to reading. Um, it's about a, a wedding rehearsal um, that gets repeated day by day. So quite a nice concept. Um, and uh, oh, the End of the Earth by uh, Abby Greaves. Yes, no, I uh, read her first book, The Silent Treatment. Yes, yes, yeah, and that was really good. 
the si that was silent treatment that was it yeah um so this um i think this is coming out soon it's supposed to be 29th of april yeah he says yeah and the other one is um by ruth hogan madame barova um so i've, I've read all of these and they're, they're all really good so i recommend those Thank you. Kia, anybody out there we should be looking out for? Yeah, sorry, I'm looking down because I'm just checking my Goodreads. Um, <laughs> I know, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> uh, How We Met by Huma Qureshi is brilliant. It's a memoir of uh, love, loss, finding her place in the world. It's really, really beautiful, really funny, really heartwarming. So I highly recommend that. Uh, a Dutiful Boy by Mohsin Zaidi uh, is a, a memoir of him coming out as a gay Muslim, which is really touching. Uh, and at the top of my TBR is The Khan by Simon Mir, which I think is out tomorrow um, and has got rave, rave reviews. So do check that out as well. Lovely. So we're all writing them down. We've all got, that's fine. This, this is costing me a fortune as well. <laughs> um, Anne Cater, who's still here, she's, uh, she says that Madam, I can't even say this, Baro, Baro, Barova. Yeah, is Ruth's best book yet. And I've read all of Ruth's books, so I shall look really forward good. to that as well. Okay, I'm I'm going to thank you guys very much for coming on and we're just going to say goodbye to everyone at the book club. Um, so thank you so much for, for mm -hmm. making my last Thanks episode. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you. It's been lovely. Really lovely. Thank we're you. We're going to say goodbye to everyone at the book club. Bye. Bye. Bye.